I'm trying to be Kristen. Am I succeeding? Right? Yeah, that is so good. All right, if I could have your eyes up here for just one moment, I have a quick announcement to make. All right, we have noticed in, in conversations, we will be moving into stage three in just a moment. Uh, Kim McMonagall and I and Remy and Gretchen will be doing this section, just so you know who's, who's going to be presenting for the remainder of the session. But we did want to mention that we've been hearing some concerns on, this is a training of trainers, but who are we training? What are we committing to? What's going on? Can we get some details? That's a very fair question. So what we thought we would do is I'd give you two pieces that you could use in your head for framing as you, as you do some thinking about that. And then in Edmodo, Bob has added a little uh, Google survey uh, form that you can fill out to indicate interest or to leave blank and not indicate interest. So my two bits of framing that I want you to consider are if this has been beneficial to you and you would like to pay it forward, specifically to APs and small groups of teachers from buildings in your area, then you might want to consider volunteering. That is one lens that you could keep in mind. Another lens to keep in mind is if this was beneficial to you, but you really think that in order to be rock solid on it, you have to go through teaching it with a team, with one of us from the Center for Professional Development and with somebody from World Class Education, if that process would be helpful for you in solidifying it, then you might also want to volunteer. So either for the pay it forward or for the learn it more deeply. Those are two lenses you can consider. As you go into Edmodo right now, there is a form that you can fill out. If you are interested in volunteering for doing some training in your region, probably in January, and you would always be able to say, no, I'm sorry, this date doesn't work for me. So if, if you might be interested in it, fill out the form. If you think at this stage, you know what? Can't do her. I don't feel comfortable enough yet. I don't think it would be the right thing for me to do. I wouldn't be doing a service. Then don't fill it out and that's fine. Is that reasonable? So we want to give you, yes, question. No, yes, absolutely. So the question was, are, are we saying if, if you fill out this Edmodo form, are we saying yes, I'll go forth on my own and conquer this? Absolutely not. No, you'd be part of a team redelivering this same type of training with some of us. So if that is something that you would be interested in doing, the audience being primarily assistant principals and small groups of teachers. And the time frame being usually, I, I believe, in January. So that's as much as we know. We would give you specifics if we had them trust us, but we just don't. Yeah. I don't know that either. The question was, would it be during the day? And I don't know that. I don't know if it would be during the day or not. I, uh, we think that it's very likely um, that it would be during the day, but okay, never mind. Never mind. We don't know. Can't answer that. I mean, if we don't want to be like a feeder trainer, but we do want to just move this forward in our own staff, we can use this all okay. <laughs> no, we would like you to learn and never share. That's just bad. What are you thinking, Gina? Honestly. Just because if we're sending groups of people to another training, but we've already started all this stuff in our own building, then are we not going to send our people to that additional training? I'm going to let world class feel free to jump in here, and I will give you my two cents. My two cents would be that if it won't be everybody from your school and if you've done something like this with them already, you might be cautious on who you select. If they are people who would appreciate hearing the same thing again but maybe getting a chance to go deeper with it or just need to hear it again, they might be good candidates. If they are people who would be resentful uh, of that, then they probably would not be good matches. That's my thinking. I, the phase one, phase two, phase three original plan was Principals phase one, BRTs phase two, and then BRTs building capacity within the system in teams supported by us to then do a training with assistant principals and anybody they wanted to bring from the building. But we don't know how many people be interested in that. It, it may or may not be the need. 
Yeah, may or may not be a need, but we want to continue to build capacity in the system. Are there other questions? Okay. Well, it's a great place to start. As we look at our stage three, and this is usually the part people get most excited about because it's the most familiar to all of us, the two enduring learnings, um, it's, we thought it might be helpful for when Liz and I were discussing this because these were the ones used with administrators and created by Dana. I have to always take a minute and do like a deep dive and say, what do these words mean to me? So um, Liz and I came up with two different interpretations and we thought it might be something to spark discussion at your table. When I see sustainability drives practices and processes, that sustainability for me is that I ensure that the learning is going to stick. So I'm looking for stage three learning opportunities and um, practices that it's gonna drive the, the thinking and the ways that I do design my lesson opportunities to really make that learning stick. So that, that for me is the first one. But Liz had a different interpretation. So as I was looking at that and I don't honestly, it's been two days and I don't honestly remember exactly what my interpretation was. <laughs> To be frank, but the, um, as I look at sustainability driving practices and processes, I think, how am I going to fit this backward planning? Oh, it goes to your point, Julie. How am I going to fit this backward planning thing into my real life? How does this work if I'm an elementary teacher and I teach a gazillion different subjects every day? How do I make this happen? And what habits can I use around backward planning that would make this something that I can actually keep up, that I can actually make a part of my regular practice and the processes of my instruction. That was what I thought of with that. And then we looked at the second one and we said practice impacts precision of developing understanding and mastery. And I thought of this as that opportunity to make sure the learning opportunities are differentiated, that I have offered enough opportunities for students to practice and that they are variety of modalities, that students have a chance for hands-on learning, for hearing it, for seeing it, for touching it, for all those different ways. So I feel like when I get to this learning trajectory, I really have to be intentional about the, the number of learning opportunities, the ways that I design them so that I can impact all the students in the classroom to ensure that the learning is sticking. So that's what we looked at for the enduring understandings. And then my lens on that one was again from more of the teacher point of view saying, I've, I've been going through this now this semester with all of my courses that I've been teaching. And having done it, every time I do it, I learn something new. And I'm like, oh, I should have done this differently. Oh, uh, this needs to change. But every time it gets faster as well. And so I see that in deepening the, developing the understanding, gaining mastery, and just how important that practice is. So what we liked about this when we had this discussion was, oh, that's why enduring understandings need to be a little bit broad. That's why they need to be a little bit abstract. That's why they need to uh, provoke questioning and wondering, is so that we can each have different but entirely valid things that we pull out of it, learnings that we pull out of it. So we're going to continue on with um, our enduring understandings and we're moving to these essential questions and thinking about what we want to get out of our time together. And we're going to use these three essential questions as part of our reflective process throughout. So at the beginning, we're just, we're just saying this is setting the stage for us. We're going to look at the significance of stage three. We want to make sure that we understand the essential components. So if you feel like you already know those, we're going to have a little survey for us just to get it so you give us some feedback about where you're at with stage three. How do I evaluate stage three for quality and alignment with stages one and two? And this even came up yesterday in that chart we had, and it was how am I going to evaluate and know a good backwards planned unit? How am I going to coach colleagues in this process? So. Um, those are big questions. We thought they're essential to this section. And we wanted to be transparent in saying that these questions, we are going to use them to guide what, what our little group is doing with you. And we are going to ask you to answer these at the end. So for you, if you are one of those people who's kind of a reflective person, you need a little while to think about things, know that these are here for you now. And at the end of the day today, when you might be a little bit more tired than you are now, we are going to ask these again 
So if as you go through in this, this little time when we're together, you see something that you think, oh, that's, that's going to fit with this for me, jot it down on something. That way toward the I end of the day when you're a little bit this. brain dead, Why possibly. Won't you won't be when I'm a little bit brain dead. You, it'll be easier for you. I only get that it. And then on our outcomes, we really just want to make sure that you understand the components that are in stage three, but then that we take it up on blooms to analyze the purpose of creating stage three last. I think we are, are all pretty good on, on getting that concept with backward planning, but it really, as you work with it, I believe, for me at least, it revealed itself even more. And then we want to give you some time to practice creating a world-class stage three, including the alignment and world-class learning opportunities and instructional strategies. And we're not just throwing that term world-class in there to brand it. We actually will be talking about what makes something world-class because that matters for teachers since it is on site. Our big ideas are the ideas of learning strategies or opportunities versus instructional strategies. And that's something that we've been intentionally asking you to do with those two column notes. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. And then what filters can I use to determine whether or not something is world-class? So those, those are kind of our, our big ideas for today. And I know that, I know that Kim is getting a little pre-assessment going for you. So I'm going to hold for just a moment. Ah, uh, sad day. I think we can. All right. So moving along with this, how, how many people have seen, can you give me a little show of hands? Have you seen this template look before? Okay, and where, where have you seen it before? I'm not going to pick on you again, Chris, because, you know, the microphone sticking from your right-hand side scares you. May I? Where did you see it before? At a GVC liaison meeting. Okay, so at a GVC liaison meeting. This may look familiar from that. So, uh, well, yesterday. Absolutely. It was brought up yesterday as well. So um, we are not asking you to use this template for our work together, but we wanted to show it to you in case teachers chose to use this version. If they did use this version, then we wanted to make sure that you could be, you had the skills to answer why it's, why it's divided like this. What's the difference between a learning strategy and an instructional strategy, or a learning opportunity and an instructional strategy? So we wanted to show you this. And I believe that we were going to ask you to do some talking on that. Let me quickly go back and look. OK. So I am not very good with your music, Miss Jamie. All right. So in a moment, we're going to do Jamie's music technique and have you stand up. And then what we'd like you to do is we would like you to uh, find someone who is either wearing a similar type of clothing Let's, let's move on exterior clothing, please. A similar type of clothing <laughs> that you can observe um, and, and partner with that person. And do, do the people who don't have partners yet a favor. If most people look like they're grouped and you still don't have a partner, go ahead and raise a hand. That way we can find each other quickly. So in a moment, Jamie is going to play some music. We'd like you to find someone with a similar type or color of exterior clothing and stand with them, and when the music turns off, we'll give you another set of instructions. Up, up. That's okay. You ain't nothing but a hound dog crying all the time. You ain't nothing but a hound dog. All right, our, <laughs> our music wasn't working. All right, is there anyone who's an orphan? Any orphans? Okay, I see a couple of orphans who are finding friends. Any other, hound, any other <laughs> orphans? I see an orphan, find another group. Join in, be a group of three. This is all good. All right, yeah. Now, whoever is taller, if it's immediately obvious, otherwise just choose. Whoever is taller, raise your hand, please. Tall person. Yes, thank you. OK. Tall people, this will be your task. 
looking up at those columns, learning strategies, or we might call them learning opportunities, versus instructional strategies. While the music is going, tell me what you think the difference between the two might be. When the music stops, I'll give you another set of instructions, okay? So what do you think the difference might be between the left and the right hand columns? Go please. All right, the next partner, the other partner. What I'd like you to do is add in your two cents, and I think I saw some unsolicited collaboration happening here <laughs> earlier, which kind of messes with the structure, I'm just saying, but no. Um, the other person, if you could add in or fill in anything that you have not already mentioned while the, while the music is playing. Wrap up your last sentence. I don't want to cut you off, but just give you a chance to wrap it up. Give your partner a high five. Tell them that they are going to hang in there and they're going to do great work yet and return to your seats. Thank you. All right. Yeah? Okay. All right. This is a great opportunity. I know, I was going to say. It's a great opportunity to have a table discussion for the next five minutes about how do we know our learning opportunities and our instructional strategies are world class. So we've spent the, the last day and a half on our outcomes being world class, our assessments being world class, and now we're looking at those, the, the amount of learning opportunities so what, is, what, what would we use as filters for determining that our learning opportunities and instructional strategies are world class? Have a table discussion. We'll ask for a little share out in a minute. Go back and look at what is the difference between those two. I know, because you were right that it's... <laughs> It's not yet five minutes. So, oh, still talking. Okay. All right. I know that maybe was more like four minutes, but it, we got some feedback about something that we were going to bring up next which is looking at this and having had the discussion that you had just briefly about filters, and we'll go back to filters, I promise, 
And remembering that I mentioned, or possibly not remembering, that I mentioned a minute ago that our two column notes thing that, that some of you are really working on hard does correlate with this. What do you think might be the difference between a learning strategy and, or a learning opportunity, you could call it, and an instructional strategy? A left column, right column difference. I should make jaws like noises. Da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum. Well, we just talked about that the learning strategies were what the students were doing, and the instructional strategies are what the teacher is doing, and the modifications that the teacher makes based on the needs of the differentiating instruction, and um, and also looking at the different the formative and the interim assessments and modifying your instruction based on that. So Liz, we could use, we had a hard time hearing it in the back corner. Do you mind just repeating some of it? Sorry. I don't, and you catch me if I'm misinterpreting, okay? So what I think I heard was on the left hand column would be what the students are doing and on the right hand column would be what I as the teacher am doing to get them there and then any changes that I might have to make or any little notes to self about if people perform in this way based on formative or interim uh, information, I might do this. If they behave this way, I might do this. Did that summarize what you were saying? Okay. Any other thoughts that you wanted to add to that? Yeah. Um, it seems to me like the, the column in the right would, would be better named instructional practices or instructional procedures. Yep. Sure. Um, because that really is kind of the process that the teacher follows as they you know go through the instruction and then obviously on the left side that's the learning strategy that the the kids will experience yeah. okay. i like that way of doing it and what i like also is that you modeled not being bound by the words on the template but by the concepts that as teachers just as as trainers today we've been kind of going back and forth between what we want you to do and thinking about how we're doing it this on the left hand side is what we want our students to experience, but then it's also important for us to take time on the right hand side to think about how they are experiencing it. How are you planning learn, um, learning opportunities to engage all your kids? So that's how I see the difference and I love that you replaced it with words until it, until it had that definition for you. And I don't think that there's any problem with doing that for yourself because if instructional practices make more sense, like to me you'll hear me saying learning opportunities, a lot because that makes sense to me. Um, I, I love that you're sticking with the concept. Did you have a thought to add? I also wondered if like your pedagogy, your belief system went into the right column. I definitely think that how, how you do things and, and how you approach learning shows up in that right hand column full on. And what I love about the right hand column is that it helps me because I, I teach very well to kids who are like me but I might not teach very well to kids who are not like me. So it gives me a chance to look at it and say, what am I doing for this type of learner? What am I doing for this type of learner? Uh, and be just a little more thoughtful by deliberately scripting that out. So as we promised, if I go back here a little bit, we promised that we were going to talk about uh, different instructional strategies, kind of the, the difference between those two bullets, and then filters that we might use to get to that world class. Because on teachers' evaluations, and it's not all about evaluations, but People are concerned with that and we should have answers. On teachers' evaluations, they talk about the teacher set, uh, chooses world-class instructional strategies or world-class this or that. So what filters might we use to get to world-class? So how do we know? Here are some things that you could include as filters for yourself. Um, one of the things that Dana mentioned would be e-coaches, e-mentors, e-experts. I would say that without the e, it's very valid as well. So not to discount somebody who's far away in favor of someone who's close by. So, but the chance to operate with real life, to give kids exposure to real life experts like we saw in that video where they were talking with the engineers. Um, integration of technology, meeting kids where they are in their own interests, and a feedback loop 
Kim, did you want to take the next Just, couple? Well, even in the first one, I was thinking yeah. if we're using Google Docs for the backwards planning doc document and we share them with someone else or even colleagues of the same grade level and we get feedback, that can be that electronic piece of, um, and you can, if people are concerned about having someone else edit or revise on their paper or give questions, probing questions, they can allow the document to just be insert comment, so then it's sticky notes on the right side. So that's a way that you can be really efficient with your time, that you may not be able to coach somebody face to face, but you can do some peer coaching and, and give some constructive feedback that way electronically. Um, integration of technology, and we hope that it's always very purposeful, and it really fits with the two for two of the C's, the communication and collaborations. When you're looking at the use of tech, that it be, um, I'll give you an example. My son came home and said his teacher uses PowerPoint and reads the PowerPoints to him. So, you know, we're always going to have a spectrum of use, but we'd like it to be very meaningful that it supports the learning. And then on the, the constant feedback, that goes back to what you were saying about how we could give feedback, but you could do that with students also. I find sometimes that students think of me as, as their safe person, and so they don't always perform to the same level for me because they know I'm gonna love them anyway, um, as they would to an outsider where they don't wanna look like a fool. Um, so there is that, that benefit to getting feedback from people outside as well as inside. And then regu regular purposeful assessment, we talked about that last time, but saying in stage three it is okay to put your assessment down there and say where does this fall? There's no problem doing that. Um, and then student reflection, are, are we giving kids time to think about their own learning and be metacognitive? I have to wonder how many of you have seen teachers start to make e-portfolios as we start to see the portfolios from professional development. Um, and I think that we're seeing more and more of the purpose for the e-portfolio is to give a space for that learning reflection. So um, I know at Cimarron they used their, their e-portfolios and did some of the data analysis and setting goals and then in the learning process then there was opportunities for students to be very reflective about the types of learning they were doing so good use for the e-portfolio so if you had a teacher ask you is my stage three world class you could look through for some for some of these lenses and say have they included some of these things as appropriate you could also look through for blooms and is what they were are are they giving students the opportunity to use those upper three levels not saying that they should just write them, but it's if, hmm, let me see, how do I phrase this? If in my outcomes I am asking kids to use the upper three levels, then we better have some practice opportunities along the way, otherwise it's not gonna be fun for us. It's gonna be too hard when we get there and we won't be successful. Did you wanna add anything else on no, that, Kim? Not. And then for those of you who are familiar with the rigor and relevance framework, are we giving them opportunities to do authentic things for authentic audiences? Real stuff for real people that makes a real difference. Are, are we doing that? Um, now you can't do that every second of the day with everything, but it's a filter that you can use. If, it, if a teacher were to ask you, how's my stage three going? Look through and say, oh, I see you're doing this cool project and you're gonna do, you're gonna do showcase it in your classroom and do a gallery walk. Could we push it slightly outside? What if we opened it up and we had other classrooms come in? What if we opened it up further and we had parents and community come in? What if we opened it up further and we posted it? And every teacher is going to be at a different place in their comfort level. You don't want to push them into something that they're not ready for necessarily, but encourage them to take that next step so that they get up to that D quadrant where they have students in the upper level of blooms, but they're also doing real world stuff. So it's that transfer that Grant Wiggins was talking about with his soccer player that she was missing. Thoughts about the filters before we move you on to your task? One, one suggestion that's worked well is to take someone's um, unit and have teachers kind of look at it. And, and there are a lot of backwards planned units online that you could start with and take one or two or three. And if you have already kind of pre-looked at them and said, I've got one in a B quadrant, one in a C, and one in a D, and then you have conversations to deconstruct them and to talk about why you think it's there, what I've started to see teachers do naturally is, is they've started to say, well, what would it take for this unit in a B quadrant? And we actually did this at our table earlier today as well and said, what would it take to move it to another level. And so having common language in a quick, easy framework to look at gives us language for 
um, how, to, how to deconstruct what we're doing. And so sometimes taking the sensitivity out of, oh, we're gonna deconstruct mine, or this is my work that I've just created, and using other people's backwards plans. It's a great non-threatening way to start, and it builds our filters really, really well. So could you take just a moment with a shoulder partner and say what other filters would be relevant to you at your school, for example? What other filters for stage three? All right, coming back together, if you could finish your thought. As I was walking around, I heard some really great filters. I'm looking for one person per table to share one filter that they thought of. And try, if you can, not to repeat filters that we've heard before. So I'm going to start with my lucky victims to my left. So in this table, what is one filter, and you can, uh, if you could stand for Judy's sake, then she won't kill me, and I really appreciate not being killed. Um, so if you could stand, I'll take one person, and I, I can do a volunteer or victim, either one is fine. A filter that you considered that we did not have up here yet. Yeah. Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> We just talked about um, the need to look at the sequence and um, the scaffolding. Nice. So learning progression for students and, and what's going to help them get there. Beautiful. Anyone here? What other filters? Let's move to this table. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Can you stand up, David? I'm actually looking for my notes here. Dr. Fagan had a... It was five words that to filter through outcomes. I am standing up. <laughs> <laughs> He's, He's um, he hard. said Dr. Fagan has five filters that he was trying to yeah, kind of she, remember. I think she presented a change agent or mm -hmm. something like that. And I think it was modern, or excuse me, important, modern, aligned, integrated. Prioritized. Prioritized. And that's, a, that's teachers critically thinking through what they're doing with their kids, whether it's an outcome or an instructional strategy. Uh, that's a practical manifestation of the, all the time we spent on the critical thinking initiatives, which I would like to see connections made to those efforts for several years yeah. with what we're doing here. That's a, that's a modeling of what we wanted from that with this structure. But again, it goes back to a belief system versus a form, and that's my broken right. record piece. It's how do we believe we're to do our practice. Right. That's what needs to change. Those are great thoughts, David. Moving over to this side, a filter, so maybe a critical thinking filter or those five words that Dr. Fagan mentioned. Not with the five words that Dr. Fagan mentioned, but 
Um, I heard this morning one of the speakers talked about um, re reference neuroscience, and I think sometimes we're, we've got all these other wonderful ideas that we're doing, but um, going back to neuroscience and brain-based research strategies is also a critical filter, um, and also looking at developmentally um, appropriate expectations. Um, you know, the Bloom's taxonomy is wonderful, but it's going to look different for a preschooler. Um, the level of extraction is going to look different depending on the age of the student and as they progress through the system. Um, but yeah, that brain-based uh, application of neuroscience I think is important too. Thanks. Well, if I could just summarize, I think some of us said that, well, do we need more filters is one of the things I heard. And so these are enough filters maybe to get us kick-started. And um, enough is that a good, a good segue to what we're going to work on next. And what I, what I love about what this highlights is the complexity of our work, that this is a true craft, this is a, a profession that is um, really worth respecting, that we every day do this kind of thing, and that we can keep these things in our minds is pretty incredible and celebration worthy, I think. So now what we'd like you to do is we'd like you to look at whatever you had chosen to do, so on your sticky notes, whatever backward planning you were doing, and to look Yes. I'm done. <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> All right. Just uh, looking around the room and knowing how I feel right after lunch, I think we could use with a little energizer. So we're going to do that. So when you hear the music, stand up behind your chair, please. <laughs> And then you turn it off, right? <laughs> All right. So uh, when you hear the music again, I want you to roam around the room and get in a group of six to eight folks. Okay? So when you hear the music, get to six to eight folks in a group. Okay, I think some of you have done this one before, uh, but we would like you to stand in your circle and put your right hand next to the shoulder, left shoulder of the person next to you. And then put your left index finger into the palm of the person next to you. Okay, everybody? Everybody there? Okay, so now, when the music starts, you are going to stay exactly like this. You're not going to move. So when the music starts, you stay like this. Then when the music stops, you are going to try to grab the finger of the person next to you at the same time as try to prevent the person next to you from grabbing your finger. OK? All right. So here we go. When the music starts, you do nothing. Okay, now we want you to switch hands. So now put your left palm out and your right index finger in the palm of the person next to you. When the music starts, do nothing. <laughs> okay, turn it. Okay, now you're going to cross over. So you're gonna put your right hand, put your right hand by your left shoulder, and then put your cross over. <laughs> Everybody got that? Okay, so when the music starts, do nothing, and then when it stops, try to rescue your finger.
All right, now cross over the other way. Cross over the other way. All right, when the music starts, you're going to head back to your seat giving three high fives to folks in the room saying how glad you are that they're here. All right, I don't know about you, but I sure needed that. Woo! <laughs> needed that. All right. So now we're going to take all of those filters that you were just thinking about, and we're going to apply them to your non-content unit that you've been working on over there on the wall. So you can grab another piece of the sticky chart paper and make those two columns, one for the learning opportunities and one for the instructional strategies or whatever form of those that you want to use and begin filling that out. Now, it may be helpful for you to actually start and just brainstorm in another space. Just kind of brainstorm. These are the kinds of things that we're thinking might be good and then intentionally sequence them before you've put them on your chart paper. So feel free to use that layer for your um, thinking. And then be intentional about looking at the filters. The one filter I didn't hear was the filter of alignment with stages one and two. So make sure that uh, you also are intentional about making sure that these uh, learning opportunities are leading them toward meeting those world-class outcomes that you've identified. All right, so we'll give you a good chunk of time here to be working um, in your groups. Are there any questions? All right, let's get to it. 